I'm very pleased to be joined by attorney Norman Siegel. He's a candidate for New York City Public Advocate. Welcome to Citywide. Thank you, Ken. So there's two words in that title, Public Advocate. The other three candidates, at least in the Democratic primary, all public officials at one point in their life. Um, you've never served an elective office. You've been an advocate. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you envision this job. Well, first, I decentralize the office. If you really want to serve people in the city of New York, you can't have an office only in the municipal building in Manhattan. You have to have a satellite office in every one of the boroughs. Second, I go out and recruit and train and supervise hopefully hundreds of volunteers. We go on Wednesday nights, Saturday mornings to senior centers, to housing developments, sit behind the old card table and do intake and listen to people's complaints. The charter says that's what the public advocate is supposed to do. And from listening to the individual complaints and helping people out, you then see if there's any systemic issues, any test case, any policy questions that come about. I'd create an institute for advocacy. Every four or five months we'd get together, we would train people throughout the city. Just think of this, Ken, if you got about 200 communities in the city of New York, you have a half a dozen advocates in each of those communities, you have a great social justice network and with email and a link up, you can move within 24 hours on an issue like term limits, on slush fund at the city council. All of those things is what a public advocate should be. A public advocate is the advocate for the public. That's a pretty ambitious agenda for an office that's got less than two dozen staff members in it. I mean, is it realistic to think that you can accomplish that much? Well, first, uh, Betsy Gottbaum, who's there now, I think has 47 on people. When I was the head of the New York Civil Liberties Union, we had 19 people. And we were pretty visible and pretty vocal on a lot of things. What I've learned by being the head of MFOI Legal Services and the Civil Liberties Union is that there are hundreds of volunteers out there waiting to get active, to use their skills to help other people. So if you set up discrete programs, Wednesday night 6 to 8, Saturday 11 to 1, and you set it up in a meaningful way, people will gravitate to a program like that. So I don't think it's ambitious. I think this office has not been utilized properly. And as an outsider, not a career pal, not someone who wants to be the mayor or go to Washington, but just wants to be the people's advocate, I think I'm a perfect fit for this. Well, let's talk about the, the two models. We can come to the candidates in the race later because there's some overlap, obviously. But, but in the two models of the office, the, I think that the, the Mark Green public advocate office was perceived as a more activist office issuing reports. Um, taking Mayor Giuliani on head-to-head -head on uh, police issues, uh, among other things. The Gottbaum model seemed to be more focused on raising money to support city services and doing individual constituent work. Which one of those models do, do you think is, is, is the better one? Well, first, I don't think those are the only two models you can have, but in response to the question, the green model would be preferable over the Gottbaum model. You know, Betsy Gottbaum's office did publish a lot of reports. Uh, I've read some of them, but they didn't resonate. They didn't get any visibility. So when you put out a report, you have to be able to then make it larger than life. You have to connect it to the day-to-day -day life of New Yorkers, and perhaps they weren't good at that. Uh, I think Green, uh, that model, but it was perceived that he was using it as a stepping stone in order to become mayor. I want to institutionalize this office and get the debate of should we have a public advocate mm -hmm. or not. I think there should be a public advocate in every city in America as an institutional check on the executive and legislative branch of government. I think there should be civil rights lawyers, public interest lawyers, journalists, social workers, community organizers in the public advocate's office and not career pals. Because this is an office that has to check the career pals. And you don't schmooze with the career pals. You don't go out and drink and eat with them. What you do is you have a working relationship, and what you do is you have to blow the whistle when they're not doing the right thing. But how do you get them to go along with something that you recommend then if you're not going to be well, your in office, partnership with them? Well, your office is a nonpartisan office. Your office is an office that if they're doing something in a particular neighborhood, uh, you help the council person, you invite them in, uh, you hold the press conference, you let them shine. Uh, so if your staff can provide the expertise and the council people can get the glory, then I think that works and that's how you get them involved. The staffs of the city council people leave a lot to be desired. 
And so if you put together the best public interest operation in the world in the public advocate's office, you can assist and be counsel in effect to all the people in the city council. They remember that, they work with you. The, the mayor is popular, his popularity has taken a hit, uh, I think, uh, recently. On the term limits um, issue. And it, do, you, do you see the role as, as just being uh, an, an ideological foil to the mayor if he's, if he's doing things that the most of the city agrees with? No, how, do you, how do you deal with a mayor that, that has such high approval ratings? Well, you work with that person, I mean, as a practical matter. If someone is in office and they have high uh, popularity ratings, uh, it would be counterproductive to be shrill over and over again. But there's things like when, you know, Michael Bloomberg, uh, I read that, you know, he's my age and he's never been in a First Amendment protest or rally. And that's mind boggling. So what a guy like I do is I go and I go, Mike, uh, you know, be incognito. Let me take you to a, a, a march or a rally and you'll see uh, the red, white, and blue that's involved in it, the right to protest. Uh, you take him to certain neighborhoods where perhaps uh, he's not popular in order for him to succeed. I think you work with someone uh, who is the mayor on things that you find common ground, but on stuff like the Republican National Convention, where arrests were made, where people were kept 40, 50, 60 hours. The public advocate should go into the mayor's office and to the police commissioner's office and say, hey, I hear you're doing this following plan makes no sense. It's unconstitutional. It'll cost the city 10 or $20 million over the next five years. Do not do that. Let me work with you. What are your fears? What are your concerns? Let me try to address them. Let me try to ameliorate them. You go public on principle, but when the issues are practical, you work with whoever wants to work with you. I grew up in Brooklyn. On the streets, can you reasonable with me? I'm reasonable with you. If you're unreasonable, I'll take a different tack. So one of the issues that has affected the mayor's popularity is his efforts to um, repeal the term limits law, at least to allow him and other elected officials to run one more time. Um, talk a little bit about your view on that issue and also <clears throat> how the mayor went about it, going to see Ron Lauder, the publishers of the major papers, his peer group, as I sometimes refer to it, uh, and then uh, only then going to the public and uh, asking them to, uh, to support his effort. Well, following what I said before, if I was the public advocate, I would go on to him and say, Michael, I hear you got this cockamamie plan. Uh, I don't think you should do that. I think it's anti-democratic. I think you're going to lose a lot of support. And plus, people like Siegel are going to go to court. Siegel's working with Randy Maestro on this issue, and they're going to go to court. In fact, that's what Giuliani, former Giuliani right, deputy right. mayor. Right, People were shocked. They said to me, what are you doing with Randy Maestro? That's what coalition is about. Uh, if you have everyone ideologically on the same page, that's not a coalition really anymore. And so we've worked together. His firm, Gibson Dunn, have been magnificent and excellent on the case. I think that it was a mistake. I think that Bloomberg won in the short run, and maybe he gets elected. But there's going to be a residue of not trusting him, not seeing him as a non-politician if he gets the third term. And it's going to be hard for him to govern because the trust factor eroded. The process was horrible. You don't overturn the people's will. You go through the public referendum and you put your cards on the table, including his money, and you try to persuade New Yorkers that this is the best thing to do. He might have won on a referendum. But now, I think he's seen differently because of the way he handled the issue, not on the merits. One of the other issues that you have um, contested with the mayor about is some of his economic development strategies of trying to use the city's uh, powers, uh, uh, eminent domain, and um, uh, other city resources to sort of push large projects forward. Um, and as a, as a public advocate, one of the appointments you would have would be to the City Planning Commission. So could you talk a little bit, not just about the eminent domain issue, which I think is an important one, but also what your, your view of, of, of development and uh, uh, land use policy would be as, as a public advocate? Yeah, I think land use is one of the <clears throat> three priorities for me, uh, especially in this economic recession. I've talked to lawyers for developers and talked about how we have to reform the land use process in New York because otherwise things are going to be frozen for the next three to five years. For example, and I know you're well informed in this area, 
most people don't know that the city charter provides for what's called a 197A plan, which is <clears throat> the vision of the community of how they want to develop the land in their area. Right now, it's merely advisory. What I would do is change the 197A and the role of the CPC, the City Planning Commission, in the following way. I would create a rebuttable presumption that the plan that goes into the City Planning Commission is presumed to be the vision and the CPC's role is to broker the deal to make the vision of the community a reality. After two years, if you can't make that deal, it's off the table. Or if a community put in a vision, no black people in our neighborhood, no gays, you can't go on that and the presumption is now rebutted. But what this would do is have the developers up front mm -hmm. working with the community. When I talk to the community, they want affordable housing. When you talk to developers, they want to build. So there's a common ground. I've worked mainly with the people in the community, and when they're not involved up front, and they come in at the end and it's a done deal, they turn to me and say, go to court and litigate. We could avoid a lot of that if we change the dynamic, and the City Planning Commission should be the agency that builds the bridge between the development community and the community activists, because we all have common ground. And I've talked with people, and if I'm the public advocate, I will try to make that change. And I think that could radically change and ameliorate the tension. There's too much anti-development rhetoric. I'm not against development. I'm against bad development, and I'm against the abuse of eminent domain, because eminent domain should be for public use. It should not be for private use. And I know the Kelo decision went the way it went, 5-4. U.S. Supreme Court. But Kennedy's plurality decision said you have to have a carefully considered plan. When Columbia is the developer-driven plan and it doesn't go before the city council and it's not carefully considered, I think that those kinds of plans should be rejected in the future. We will uh, talk about uh, your path to becoming the public advocate when Citywide continues right after this. These things we count on every day started as ideas. Ideas from the minds of African Americans. Support minority education today so we don't miss out on the next big idea tomorrow. The United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Welcome back to Citywide. We're talking politics with attorney Norman Siegel, candidate for public advocate of the city of New York. We are in the midst of an economic tsunami. Uh, one minute uh, prosperity, uh, the next minute recession, maybe depression. One minute people are laying in the beach, the next minute there's a wall of water and the ones who drown are not necessarily responsible for, uh, for causing the problem. New York City itself has had a remarkable resurgence over the last uh, uh, 20 years. Um, and now its role as a financial center is threatened. Uh, and perhaps uh, we haven't seen it yet, but the social fabric of the city is starting to fray. It's a new reality. What does that say to you about the kinds of things that city government in general, the kinds of issues that need to be pursued? You have to have balanced budgets. Uh, the three not-for-profits I've run, uh, Cardinal Rule number one, you can control your expenses. You never can control the income. So you really have to be careful about your expenditures. And you can't have a slush fund where they create fictitious organizations. Uh, you can't have member items uh, like we used to. It should be published. Uh, you have to uh, run a tight ship. Uh, second, <clears throat> you have to begin to be creative. Uh, people who are on public assistance, perhaps they should be switched to Social Security disability so that the federal government is paying for that, plus the people in that situation will get more dollars than from the state and city funds. Uh, the state government recently passed the budget, and they're dysfunctional. Uh, the process was horrible. Nobody knew what was in the budget. And then you find 9% increase in spending on the federal level, although I love Obama and I was for him in 07. Uh, I don't understand the 
stimulus package, no conditions. AIG can give the bonuses. Uh, GM and Chrysler get money without any conditions. Uh, it makes no sense. Where I grew up, if the government's giving you money, there's usually some conditions for it. And we need to be very careful that the stimulus money doesn't become pork money. And it's not just a conservative or liberal issue, it's everyone's issue. We're facing something, as you said, Ken, that unless you were around in 1929, <clears throat> and neither of us uh, were, this is a huge challenge. And I think it changes the playing field. I think it has to change the mindset. And people have to come together. Now, the great thing about New Yorkers is that we rise to the occasion on these kinds of challenges. So um, one of your competitors for the race, uh, Bill de Blasio um, and his allies in the Working Families Party <clears throat> uh, successfully called for increasing uh, what they called a millionaire's tax, but turned out to be a tax on people making $300,000 and above. Um, the mayor mildly said that he loved the rich people because they were the ones that provided uh, uh, the drive to the city's economic engine. In striking that balance, where, where is the future? Is the priority right now uh, helping uh, the people who work in the Manhattan office buildings uh, continue to, to pump up the economy? Uh, is it taking care of the people at the bottom of the economic uh, spectrum who don't have less resources? What's, what's the most important thing for the mayor and the council and the other elected officials to be, to be doing right now to help New York navigate its way out of this? Well, they have to be fiscally responsible and they can't do the member items, they can't do the pork. That's why people don't trust politicians. The politicians are a couple of levels higher than Bernie Madoff, but not very much. I'll give you an example. We had a press conference showing some leadership. I represent a lot of the 9-11 family members. The Port Authority gave an $84 million contract for the first 20 floors on the Freedom Tower to a company in China. Uh, there's glass manufacturers in Nanuet, New York, in Pittsburgh, and $84 million contract. You can't make this stuff up. We need jobs. We got to keep the economy going. And the Port Authority is giving a huge multi million dollar contract to a company in China. But wasn't, isn't, isn't that New York's uh, raison d'etre is global trade and, and, and the fact that you, you do things on that level? Why, would they, why should the taxpayers pay extra just to, to subsidize a, a factory in, in, in Nanuet? It doesn't have to be extra. What you do is you set up a process where the lowest bid, the other people have a chance. When the amount is X, you can match it. And if everything's equal, you give the contract to an American company because we are in an economic recession. And until we get out, you have to set up the process that gives a priority and a preference to American companies. So would you have China do the same thing with, with, you know, when they have the opportunity to buy computers from IBM, which is also a New York company? I think we have to look at these issues, recognizing that we're in a sui generis, one-of-a-kind situation that we've never been in before. The president wants people to be U.S. citizens to be gainfully employed. People don't understand how serious it is, not only financially but psychologically, when people are laid off. We have to do everything we can to keep jobs, retraining programs, and when you talk about the economy, the public advocate can play a very important role in holding town hall meetings, bringing experts together, short-term and long-term recommendations to deal with the economy. You can't put your head in the sand. This is a painful reality. We've got to change the way we do business in New York. And when the state government does what it did recently did, it's dysfunctional and people begin to give up with regard to government officials. And once the government officials don't have the trust and the confidence of the people, you're in trouble. Mark Green, uh, former public advocate, um, uh, entered this race, I think to the surprise of a lot of people, perhaps including Mark Green, um, having been on the sidelines of politics for a while, although acting as a commentator uh, in a variety of capacities. The other two candidates for the office are uh, council members, um, uh, both with uh, very energetic records, Bill de Blasio, Eric Joya. Um, you are a lawyer, not a professional politician, uh, as they do, although you practice often in the court of public opinion uh, as right. well as the, as the courtroom. Um, and I know that everybody sort of draws that, that kind of a distinction, but I want to ask a different question. 
Is there a generational shift going on in politics? Is it, it do you and Mark Green um, reflect a different way of looking at um, activism than um, Bill de Blasio and Eric Joya do, just by virtue of, of, of your, the difference in your ages? I don't buy into that premise. Uh, I think that uh, age, uh, in some ways, is irrelevant. Uh, I work with all different age groups, and what you uh, find is people who have been around longer than other people, they just have more experience. But the other characteristics about energy, creativity, intelligence, integrity, uh, it doesn't matter whether you're 19 or 91. Uh, those things can be found or not found in either of those groups. I think it's important to have a historical perspective when you're talking about social justice and change and making New York even better than it has been. Uh, and I think that by having that kind of historical knowledge and experience, it helps you be a better uh, public servant. So let's talk about the, the politics of the race for a second. Green uh, has uh, very high number recognition uh, experience uh, as a candidate, um, and, uh, and the rationale, I guess, in the sense <coughs> that people would credit him with having been an effective public advocate and, and therefore needs it again. Uh, the other elected officials, less well known, uh, but uh, both of them have demonstrated strong organizing skills. De Blasio, a lot of organized labor support. Joy has uh, built an army of people that have been supporting him, small donations and the like. Um, t you ran for public advocate before. You, you ran well in a, in a competitive race, uh, came in second. Um, but you don't have the same type of, of, of institutional support or political relationships that, uh, that the other candidates might have. So tell us, uh, in the time we have left, how you're going to win the race, and, 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 and again, sort of, sort of recast for us what distinguishes you from, from the other candidates. Well, the, the second part is easiest. First, uh, I'm not a career poll. I don't want to run for mayor or United States senator. I want to be the public advocate, the people's lawyer, the people's advocate. Uh, there are many people throughout the city uh, who know who I am. They know my record. They know I fight for people. I believe in neutral principles. And therefore, this is what I've been doing for 40 years, and it's who I am, and I'm a natural fit for this position. Uh, with regard to how I win, I've come in twice. Uh, Lucky for me, Betsy Gottbaum decided she wouldn't run again. And if I can keep the 121,000 people that voted for me last time and add another 40 or 50,000 people, I can win this race outright. If not, I can get in the runoff and then hopefully persuade people that because of the times that you need an outsider, you need a civil rights, social justice mindset in this particular office. And finally, <coughs> I was for Obama early on. Uh, my opponents were not. Eventually, they switched to Obama. The Obama model is a good model. Uh, the way you describe me, well, you could have described Obama like that in 07. I've got plenty of energy. I've got lots of ideas. I have lots of volunteers who believe that uh, we can still do better than we're doing now, who dare to dream about how it should be, not how it is. And that multiracial coalition uh, can help me become the next public advocate. My thanks to Attorney Norman Siegel, candidate for New York City Public Advocate. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Citywide.